features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. We're on a roll, we're driving around, who knows what we're going to see. This is Safari Live. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to, well, an afternoon safari, a sunset safari. My name is Taylor and on camera with me today is Craig. And well, quite interesting, I'll tell you a funny story in just a moment. Anyways, <laughs> we are hoping to find all sorts of wonderful animals out on safari today. It's been exceptionally hot so you can guess it, we're going to be checking watering holes to hopefully find some animals going down to quench their thirst. But this is a live and interactive safari, yes it's happening right now and you can ask us any questions you'd like to about coming on a safari, about the animals, perhaps you'd like to see a specific type of bird and you can do so by hashtagging safari live on Twitter right let me tell you the funny story um, so Craig and I thought we were doing pre-show hey Craig <laughs> so we did the entire pre-show as well <laughs> with absolutely nobody listening to us <laughs> Craig is not in hysterics he's laying down he's laughing so hard yes <laughs> I was wondering why Alice was telling me starting disclaimer now and she's giving me all these cues and I'm like but we've just done the pre-show <laughs> so I did the pre-show on Impala Rams and uh, they were pushing and shoving you didn't see this though <laughs> that's so funny but anyways yes well well at least I warm my voice up I suppose I think first things first is um, we're going to go and have a look and see if we can maybe find some elephants. I'm in two minds this afternoon if we should maybe just pop onto Gauri, Maine and just have a look and see if that young male leopard that crossed south perhaps has come this way and also to see if there's any movement of those wild dogs. They also crossed south not too far from here so they could have come back the same way. So that'll be quite exciting. Obviously I think we just missed those wild dogs this morning not by very much like i said well we briefly saw the tracks it was difficult from the angle at which we were and um, they hadn't been down on the ground for very long but they move at one massive speed but let's see what else we've got so far it's pretty quiet bit of a breeze but we've had quite a bit of wind for most of the day so i suspect this afternoon for the sunset will be lovely and pleasant so it will be quite nice anyways who knows what's going to be on the cards this afternoon we'll have to see but i'm going to send you across to tristan now to say hello well good afternoon everybody and welcome to our sunset safari with me tristan and sebastian on camera and well it couldn't have gotten off to any better a start possible because we have found very fresh male lion tracks they're on top of my vehicle tracks from this morning i drove here this morning and there were no lion tracks here this morning so it means that we have a male lion somewhere on juma the tracks have come from arethusa simambili side and they seem to be coming here and walking southwards but i just lost them now so i'm trying to go a little bit further forward to back where i last had a track and see where he's gone maybe he's just gone off the road and lay somewhere close by here so I just want to make a hundred percent sure before I carry on and choose a direction as to where to go there's lots of great places for a lion to have a rest and I see his tracks are right here so he must have walked here Seb now I'll try and show you the tracks that I'm talking about it looks like he went off in this direction here. Maybe he's lying under these quarry bushes. But these are the footprints that I'm talking about just on my right hand side. They're coming down the road. You can see there's a nice big set of them. And so those were not there this morning. And they don't look very large in that position. And I'm going to get out and I'll just show you just how big those are by using my hand. 
Now, hopefully he's not lying right next to the road and he eats me, but I doubt that he will. But if we have a look, I'm going to put my handprint next to it. And it hasn't come out very clearly, actually, so I'll have to just kind of squish it in there to make it visible. But there you go, that's my handprint as opposed to a big male lion's track. And so he must be here somewhere, because I checked the road a little bit to the other side here and there was no sign of any male lion crossing that side. So I think he might be lying in these quarry thickets somewhere on my right, left hand side. What I want to try and do is I'm going to try and just quickly just do a little off-roading through here and just check some of these areas because from there his tracks don't seem to kind of come through so he must have gone off-road here and maybe he's just decided he's found a place to lie down so I want to quickly just check through here and there's lots of perfect hidey holes for a big male lion to lie down and if he is flat in this longer grass it's going to be quite a struggle to actually find him and to be able to see him so we're going to just do a little loop round hmm I would have thought we would have been able to see him if he was lying especially now with us off-roading given that it's probably been quiet for him all day he might have just popped his head up to listen to what's going on so Sorry, Sam, it's going to be a bit tight in here. Watch on the left, there's some buffalo thorns. Now remember, this is live, it is interactive, so it does mean that you can get hold of us. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, should you want to ask any questions. And I was saying in the pre-show that maybe some of you should let us know as to what you want to see this afternoon. So you can use hashtag to let me know what you would feel like seeing this afternoon. Now I'm just going to check here, because if he did come through, he should have walked this way. Sorry. James, you say jackals and a leopard. Well, James, I would love either one of those as well. That would be absolutely perfect for me. I wouldn't mind. I'm not going to say no to a big lion though either. I can tell you that much. If there is a male lion here, I certainly will not say no to that. So I'm just going to quickly just check these power lines and along this way. Now Dave you say Hosanna and hopefully he'll be around. We had his tracks this morning, well, what I think is his tracks this morning. Herbie had them crossing into Little Gowrie but you know with Hosanna he walks around a lot during the day and so could very well be already back somewhere outside sitting at Twin Dams or Treehouse Dam. We know he likes to frequent both those areas. Um, no, nothing here. So, Patrick, you're asking how we tell how fresh tracks are. Well, in this instance, I know because I drove here this morning, so I know that this line has walked since I drove this morning, which means that it's got to be in the morning time, and we know from lions that when they walk in the mornings, generally they're going to find somewhere to lie down, and they're then going to nap. And so they will be fairly fresh. When I say they're fresh, I'm talking about they're pretty much going to be ones that are worth following, that's for sure. So those are the reasons why I say fresh. Um, in terms of other factors we would have used, we would have used wind. Wind blows a layer on top of those tracks. So those tracks have been slightly disturbed by wind because it's during the day we have had a breeze blowing. So they're not from this instant, but because it's warm, I know that wherever this lion walked, as of about 10 o'clock, if it was still walking, it's going to have laid down. Much like what we saw with Tinio yesterday, it gets to a point where it gets too warm for them and they get tired and then they then flop down unless there's a reason to walk and if there's a reason to walk it's normally if something's being killed and they go then and trot that way and we haven't heard any sort of buffalo in distress or anything like that and so the likelihood of something dying is very very slim but I honestly don't know where our male lion went from where we last had those tracks because they just disappear from here so he must have carried on going south towards Impala Plains. I want to just check the main road quickly, which is going to be tough because as you'll see, a car is now going to grace our presence. Three, two, one. There we go. There's a car going past us. And so that will have driven over a lot of the tracks during the day today. But I'll go and just check quickly and see if I can't find any sign of this male lion somewhere here. I'm hoping that his tracks haven't crossed out like the leopards have been doing over the last few days. But it's encouraging that there was nothing on the power lines. If there's nothing on the power lines, it tends to suggest this lion has pushed deeper into Juma and is hopefully then lying up maybe somewhere here around Impala Plains. There is another big 
sort of drainage section on our left hand side and these people are busy reversing so maybe they've spotted our male lion friend somewhere here they see they're busy pointing into the bush here so it could be that he's somewhere in this direction his tracks were coming in this way so I wouldn't be surprised if he is here somewhere on our left hand side So, Luca, you wondering how many lions or lionesses make up a pride? Well, Luca, it depends on the area and depends on the lions themselves. It's very, very, very diff different in each pride. Now, I don't know what these guys are seeing because I don't see anything here. Seb, do you see anything? But it depends on the pride. Some prides will be larger than others. So on average, the prides in this area, well, the main pride that we see is 11. It's five lionesses, six cubs. And then it has four dominant males that are part of a coalition. And coalitions will vary from one male to six males or more sometimes. But in this area, we have a coalition of four and our main pride is 11 lions. Then in further south, another pride that we see is three lionesses and they have, I think, eight cubs now, or six cubs, somewhere around there. I can't remember, I haven't seen the new cubs and I don't actually know how many new cubs they've got. So that's another pride and then we have a torchwood pride a little bit further that is theoretically 19 lions So it's quite a few and it depends on each lion pride will have different numbers But I certainly don't see anything what I do see actually is maybe what they were looking at is this black-headed oriole Do you see it there Seb on the knob thorn? So a beautiful bird and I haven't gotten a black-headed oriole on screen in the entire time I've been at Safari Live and we got one this morning and now another one this afternoon So where is it gone? Is it there? Uh, there it is, just hidden behind the foliage. You can see a beautiful black, black, black head and that bright golden chest area with green wings. It is one of my favorite birds, Archer. And then that red eye. And off he goes. Listen to his call. There we go. So nice to see them. And that is the male. The female is a little bit more drab. She doesn't have that black head like he does. Right, well I don't see anything here in front where these people would have reversed to see. Maybe they spotted the black-headed oriole like we just did. So we're going to carry on and see what else we can find and see if I can't find this lion and where he went. Roshni, are you wondering what birds we see migrating to Juma during the winter? Ooh. Hang on, now I've got to think about this. Not many that I can actually think of. Um, none, actually, that I know of. Seb, do you know of any? No, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. There might be, but I definitely can't think of any off the top of my head at this stage. The reason why a lot of our birds migrate away from here is because of how dry it gets in our winter. So birds are not fond of dry areas because generally dry areas means less food and therefore very difficult for certain animals to find and to sustain themselves or certain birds should I say and so they t typically then migrate to wetter areas so I can't think of any I'll try give it some thought and maybe I'll remember one or two but I at the moment really off the top of my head can't remember any and while I try and sort of think about all of this let's go back to Miss McCurdy and see where she plans on looking for these crazy painted wolves that she wants to find this afternoon Tristan, your links are always so fantastic. I'm, I don't know where I'm going to look yet. We're still trying to find elephants, but I just did a quick boundary patrol and I haven't seen any elephant tracks coming in at all. So maybe they're still here. So I think we're going to go with some old favorites uh, of the roads that elephants seem to enjoy. Now, apparently Paws was actually wondering if we could see some elephants, so hopefully we will. So we might check Mama Road, then we might go a little bit into the Mulwati. Then go Vulture, uh, not Vulture's Nest, we'll do Nyala Road South, then Nyala Road North, check Bivalzook Dam, and then just weave and wind in between all the different roads. I always find that those are good roads to start checking, just purely based on the fact that they run along drainage lines, and we know on a windy day, most of the animals will try and keep out of the wind, and then because it's winter, the vegetation along the drainage lines is a lot greener. Now, what is quite nice, when you do the hot air balloons, sort of rides when James narrates over them 
you can see that very very clearly how dry it is the, gold, the yellow grass and then as soon as you go anywhere near any river systems how beautiful and green it is and of course you have seen this when we've uh, taken to the air with a drone as well get a nice aerial view of what's exactly going on on the ground now I do want to let you know uh, unfortunately Mara is not joining us today so no zebra is being chased by crocodiles and then eaten by lions how amazing was that sighting sure I think that that zebra was obviously not meant to make it past today I think that's when you know that it's your time right we're not gonna go down this one no that's leadwood we want to go on the next one we'll just go up a little bit further and then we'll see I actually can't believe how much the wind has picked up it's very unusual for this time of the year typically we only get wind in about August September it picks up so to be having it in the middle of winter I find particularly unusual because last year it was still warm you know temperatures um, quite high anywhere between 68 and 78 degree Fahrenheit and but not a breath of wind not a cloud in the sky nothing like that the weather is different but there are a couple of you won't be able to see them because they're behind us there are a couple of cirrus clouds in the sky which typically mean that bad weather is on its way so maybe the coast is building up to another cold front maybe we're going to get the the tail end of it so it might mean some clouds and maybe that's why we've got a bit of wind but anyways right i hope tristan manages to find that lion it'll be nice Yes. Now, Roshni, you're wondering if summer would be a better time to build up your bird list. Most certainly. That's when we see some amazing migrants coming through. Uh, so, yes, Roshni. What's, Craig, is that a stump or what's that thing? Do you see what I'm talking about? If you zoom straight down the road, there's something. It's a stumpasaurus. Now, you see that marula, not the big marula on the left, but the, the little stump that's sticking out. That actually for a moment from where I'm sitting looked like perhaps a leopard standing on the edge of the road looking over the grass. Well that's what I was wanting it to be but unfortunately not a leopard. Yet another stump. At least it wasn't a termite mound this time. I feel as though the termite mounds have got me. So sorry Roshni. Yes. But, um, you'll still see some nice ones now. I was actually also trying to think when Tristan was answering the question what birds come migrate for our winters I also can't think of any I don't know if we get any but also it could just be slipping Tristan and our mind we did also play a game of hacky sack uh, before the safari this afternoon so maybe that's why our brains aren't working too well because we're exhausted after kicking that around was myself Tristan Connor and Craig and we worked out that four people in hacky sack is a much better number much easier because we were attempting to do it with three and and trying to play it at night and it was a disaster we weren't very good at all <clears throat> but we've got better now we did some great moves okay this is all old old evidence of elephants this is from the other morning we might actually have to do a, a Muwati cruise hang on Oh my goodness, he's done it again, hasn't he? How does he do this, Tristan? He always manages to pull so all sorts of things from underneath his hat, and, he's, and like I said, he has done it again. So without further ado, let's go across to Tristan and see what he's got. Well, Taylor, I just rubbed up against you during our happy, hacky sack game this afternoon and took all your lion luck just for this afternoon so there we go look at that we have one of our Birmingham boys lying down so super happy it wasn't far off where I last had his footprints we knew he would be somewhere around here once we did the edge and knew he didn't cross out he had to be somewhere here and so we have Nena who is lying down having a really good rest and I would have imagined this is going to be the case you can see his belly is somewhat full so he was obviously with Tinho at some point I know there was at a point two male lines on that zebra carcass so he must have been the other culprit and he's definitely got a fairly big bump on his belly not quite as big as what Tinio had yesterday but still enough to make him go into a coma with the heat and food and he'll just kind of sleep it off until a little bit later but the best thing about this is that well hopefully it'll be exactly like what Taylor had yesterday and later we'll be able to hear him roaring again a bit later Laura you say so cute well 
I don't know if I, male lions are cute. Uh, there's many sleep it off until a little bit later. But the best thing about this is that, well, hopefully it'll be exactly like what Taylor had yesterday and later we'll be able to hear him roaring again a bit later. Laura, you say so cute. Well, I don't know if I, male lions are cute. Uh, there's many Where to see him doing his runway strut hopefully he'll get up and start strutting around and we'll have to then give him a score and judge him on his runway walk I'm pretty sure it will be very good he tends to have the swagger the Birmingham boys all do they kind of have this little hip bounce that they do and it's pretty cool to watch them walking around so very 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 happy to find them that's an unexpected surprise I really after this morning when we drove this area I thought no there's no chance that we're going to be able to find this Birmingham boy and so super excited that we managed to actually get him and thank you for walking around during the day Nena that's very nice of you but look at the size of those paws he's got massive massive feet it's quite interesting with the Birmingham boys and I would love to actually see all four of them together again and just more than actually seeing all four together tracking all four together because there's definitely we find tracks often of the Birmingham boys and there's a marked difference between some of them there's one that has very small feet that almost looks like a female's track and then there's Nena who has a, quite a large foot when we were tracking him just now I was just looking at it and he actually has quite a big foot it's not quite as big as some of the feet that I've seen the Matimbas used to have massive feet but it would be interesting to see which of the four actually has the biggest feet now Justin you wondering which is the most dominant of the four Birmingham boys well Justin this is an interesting question and one that I don't know if we can actually answer at the moment we've seen so little of the Birmingham boys lately and and particularly within the groupings of females that we see we haven't seen who's been mating we haven't seen who's been sort of looking after cubs and so it's a difficult call to make as to who is dominant at the moment we know that Tinyo spends a lot of time with the Inkahuma Pride. He tends to seem to like the Inkahuma Pride, so we know he's there quite a bit. But in terms of the dominant, most dominant one, I don't know. We know that Insuku walks big distances and covers a lot of territory, which means he's the one that's, and Mfumo as well, which are the two that are probably looking after these things and trying to sort of mark out territories and making sure that their area is safe. And then, uh, well, he seems to just kind of bounce around. He's pops up in the most random places so it's difficult to say I think what we need is we need a situation like we had last year where the Nkuma Pride spends a, a vast majority of their time here and then we can watch the interactions of the four brothers or four, four coalition members together and see who actually dominates those situations Faith, you're wondering if male lions are generally alone. Well, Faith, it depends. So in this situation, the Birmingham boys recently are very much on their own. They tend to like to spend time by themselves. Um, what's happened is, is they've established a really large territory and they have a lot of area to patrol. And, and on top of that, there's a lot of females to mate with. So they currently are mating with the Torchwood Pride, they're mating with the Inkahuma Pride and the Styx Pride and that's a number of different females to cover and very large area that they're looking for. They're even getting the Salalas and the Mangen Pride slowly filtering back into their areas so it's going to be interesting just to see how that goes and that means that they stretch quite thin and so they each one goes off in different direction, goes to different prides, marks different areas and they spend a lot of time on their own. If you have a smaller coalition like the Matimbas, they tended to be on together more often than not so those two males tended to walk around together every single day unless they were in a mating situation where one would then break off with a female and they would spend a lot more time as a coalition um, together. The Majingalan males have always been males that have spent a lot of time together even when they mate and they go and they feed on carcasses within a few days they generally are back together. It's very seldom that we used to see the Majingalans completely split up. We used to see at least two or three together at a time so it was they seem to be a lot more cohesive as a unit. The Mopokos we know split with the Kinky Tail and, and Mr. T that came up into the north and the rest down into the western side and central parts of the Sabi Sands and they formed their own little groupings together and they were also very seldom them on their own those two groupings so it just depends on on the dynamics and the numbers as well as the amount of area that they're having to cover these guys just cover so much that they at the moment spread so thin they also haven't been tested which means there's no reason for them to stay together so George it's, this is also a, it, it, a sort of 
An interesting one. You, you're wondering whether a male lion with more scars is either more dominant or less dominant. It, it depends. And in a situation with lions, a lot of their scars can theoretically come from the from the females. We know that both Tinyo and Mfumo have suffered a few blows from the Inkuhuma pride when they were feeding on carcasses and during that period that they spent a lot of time here and so some of the scars and cuts would have come from them and that's no way dominance within the coalition members but theoretically what you probably find is the reason why Nena is not as scarred up as the other two is he and Nsuko tended they developed their manes a little bit quicker than the other two did so their manes got bigger and bulkier and that would have signified to those two Mfumo and Tinyo that these guys are slightly larger bigger and more dominant over them and that's maybe why they've clashed a lot the two of them over scraps whereas Nena and Nsuko maybe have fed a little bit easier and haven't had to fight with one another as much because their mains have dominated the, what's been going on. That's just a theory it's in no way fact and it's a difficult thing to say. I've seen some of the more dominant members if you look at the Majingalan coalition um, the one that's known as Smudge, the one with this sort of bare nose, he's got lots of scars and he's the dominant male within that coalition now. In the beginning it was a different male and that was the dark maned Majingi and he had, you know, he didn't have as many scars at all. So it just depends also as how things go through their life. Now, I would imagine within this grouping that Insuko or Nene must be one of the more dominant ones. So James, the lack of buffalo in terms of affecting territories of these prides and coalitions, interesting, I don't know. I, I, I mean, we've never had a situation, and certainly not in my time in the Sabi Sands, where we've had such a lack of buffalo in the area. It really is the first time that I've seen so few buffalo in as many months as we've sort of been watching this pr procession or this development from the drought last year. So. Uh, to, uh, to be honest, I don't know. I, I would imagine that, yes, their territories, they will try and push more and more and more to try and find the food that they need. But if there's no buffalo and there's, there's competition nearby, in the Nkuhuma's case, the Torchwood Pride, that is keeping them at a certain place, then they will make do with what's there. So they'll start turning more to kudu, zebra, wildebeest, giraffe, um, impalas, those kind of animals to try and sustain themselves. With the coalitions, they are very much, it depends on what's around them. So the more coalition members we have around us, the less likely they're going to be able to push. So you'll find the Birminghams will push and push and push until they hear other lions and they'll then come back. So they might range more to try and find buffalo, but as soon as they met with resistance, and if it's a sort of a big resistance in terms of, let's say, the Majingalans or a coalition of five male lions in Kruger, then you'll find they're going to stop and they're going to recede back into their territory and they're not going to push too much further. So that's how it kind of works with the males. The females, a little bit less sort of territorial and they'll be a little bit more fluid in their movements than what the males are. Well we're going to sit here, I, I would imagine he's going to be very sleepy for most of the afternoon so probably we'll sit here for a little bit longer and then go and carry on exploring in the afternoon and then come back around sunset time and see if he then wakes up. But while we do that and enjoy the peaceful sight of Nena having a nap, let's go across to Miss Taylor McCurdy who I would imagine could give him some competition when it comes to a main challenge. Well, thank you, Tristan. <laughs> We're tracking elephants at the moment, things without manes. Now, we're quite sneaky because I spoke to Aubrey and I said, what happened to that herd of elephants from this morning? And he'd said to me, you know, he thinks that they were maybe going to come south from Inyala Road, South Central. And they did. They started walking that way and then they turned around and they've walked along Inyala Road North now. We've got their tracks on the road. We've got their dung. But they move quite quickly. So I just hope that they haven't gone too far and crossed out past Buffletook Dam because they tend to do that sometimes. We will just check here and you can see, look at all their dung in the road. They were very, very busy. Lots of footprints. So we're on the right track, but let's keep going and hopefully we'll find the big grey giants. But because it's been quite windy, you would expect to see lots and lots of dust and sort of debris all scattered over the elephant tracks but it doesn't look like there's too much so maybe maybe it's because it's quite fresh maybe they did feed down in that drainage line for a bit and only just recently decided to come back up this way but I suppose we won't really know for certain until we find them and then we can start putting everything all the pieces of the puzzle together let's check I just keep hoping that I'm gonna come around the corner and then there they are not yet though how rude. 
Look at this. Now I have to get out. What an inconvenience, these elephants. Suppose I can't take my radio with me. Oh. I got all tangled. Right, let me move this very quickly. Oh my goodness, it almost took my earpiece. With it. Oh, the so elephants have been very busy. Fix my blankets so I can sit nicely. Okay, let's continue with our search for the elephants. Now that we don't have a roadblock anymore, constantly doing that. That's from a dead tree, so maybe there was a whole pile of those le uh, dead branches piled up and they were picking them up and moving them out of the way so that they could feed on the nice green grass. We've still got the tracks still going in the right direction. And I just need to make sure if they do take a turn off of the road that I see where they go. They're either going to go north towards Bifflesook Dam or they're going to go along Gwari Pan Road. And then they'll come back around onto Central, they do this all the time, and then drink and dig for water in the drainage line in Yala Road North and South. We've seen them there a couple of times. Now I'm going to look for footprints because the ground is quite hard here. And they still seem to be going towards the dam. My goodness, they're moving quite a bit. Now, oh well, you're wondering if elephants have any predators. Yes, they do. Can you believe that? That the largest land mammal has got to worry about lions. Not in this area, they don't seem to hunt lions, but if you go up to uh, Wangi in Zimbabwe, wow, many, many, many opportunities to see lions taking down elephants, especially in the dry season. Um, so yes, yeah, so there are prides that specialize, especially the larger prides of lions. As you can imagine, if you have a super pride of lions, maybe that have 30 or 40 members in, and they do exist, can you believe it? Then they need to catch something large enough. A buffalo just won't do it. They will all get a mouthful. It's like the equivalent of the Nkuhuma pride catching an impala. It's really not enough to fill their bellies. So they need to catch things like giraffe, like hippos, and then of course an elephant would be ideal. Now they're not targeting the big five ton elephant bulls, because that would be virtually impossible. In terms of predators for a five ton elephant bull, sadly we as humans are the biggest culprits. Um, to to them and then and then of course the younger bulls that are just recently been kicked out of the herd they haven't quite established them they're the ones that are at risk to lions elephant Woo I think we've just missed the breeding herd hopefully we haven't all their tracks hopefully we haven't all their tracks are here there they are oh there's an elef another elephant bull coming down hi gentlemen I'm just going to go a little bit further forward because there's a bull coming down to drink as well. So we've got this young fellow over here who's giving us the evil eye. Oh, never mind. The other elephant is coming to us. See how he's smelling? He's not smelling us. He was actually smelling that other bull who's just on the other side of the dam. And they've obviously seen each other. I'm just going to duck for you quickly. I wonder if we might get lucky and see them pushing and shoving. At the moment, that bull is smelling elephant dung probably from the breeding herd they've already come down and had a drink we must have missed them they could still be moving through the block and crossing Bivol's hook boundary so he's trying to pick up on their scent now he's spending quite a bit of time see that touching the dung there might be a bit of urine on the ground too and then he puts his entire trunk into his mouth and he'll be able to tell if cows are in estrus Very nice. But now you can see, you can probably hear how windy it is as well. It would actually be a good spot down in the dam where that Ellie bull is standing. It will be very sheltered. What I will try and do at some point is because we know these boys are here and unless they're going to push and shove each other around or have a nice bath in the water, we might actually see if we can quickly catch the breeding herd because I think it's a particularly large group. But let's see what this fella does for us. Teddy's gonna, you're gonna drink. It's not very nice water to drink, but anyways. Now, George, you're wondering how far away can elephants smell water? Well, they can sense it underneath the ground, definitely. 
I don't know if they're necessarily smelling it from kilometers and kilometers away. I think what happens there is that the elephants remember. They learn the various routes um, that have been passed down from generation to generation. Some Egyptian geese also coming into frame. They don't want to be left out this afternoon. And I think, so that whole thing of them sort of marching, sometimes it almost looks like they're running towards a watering hole. I think that's just them remembering that there was a pan here once, we've drank from this, you know, so many times that, you know, sometimes they're probably disappointed they arrive at a dam that might have been full at one point and a few months later it could be completely dried out. Then they might try and dig in that pan to see if they can get the water from under the ground or they'll have to move on and find another one. So I don't, I don't know if they necessarily can smell it from kilometers and kilometers away. I'm surprised though that that bull is drinking this water because it's not very clean. The Vilzuk Dam, it's sort of, I don't know, I, well, I suppose it must be alright, but elephants prefer clean water. I think that this other bull on the left is going to go and cause trouble. I think we might have a little standoff over here. You see he's walking towards him now, but he turned, he almost spun in a spot and had his ears sort of open and facing in that chap's direction, not worried about us. And they're both at that age where they think that they're the biggest, strongest elephants out here, but in reality, they aren't. They're probably in their mid-twenties, mid I would say. Not anywhere near having the authority to mate with females just yet, but they don't know that. Well, they like to think differently. Yeah, I think he's going to go. Let's go up, up a little bit closer, Craig, I think, while he's walking away. <laughs> this might be a cool interaction. Can't see hippos today. I'm also just trying to scan to see if I can't see any movement of elephants going through this area. Mm, no. Let's see. Now a question from Rachel. Hello boy. You've already been in the water, we can see this. Sorry, Rachel. I was just watching this elephant because I thought he was maybe going to give us a bit of a mock charge there. And I can find, I found the breeding herd too. The question from you was, do elephants do phlegm and grimace or do only predators do? Now, actually, it's quite funny, Rachel. It's not restricted to just the, the predators of the lions and leopards. You know, the best example, in my opinion, of an animal that does a phlegm and grimace is probably a horse. Have you ever been to a stable yard and you've gone past a couple of the stalls and the horses stuck its head out and, and then all of a sudden it curls its top lip up? That's a phlegm and grimace too. That's exactly the same thing. I remember my horse would do it if I'd wear a strange perfume or if he didn't particularly like the smell of something. You know, if I maybe put hand lotion on my hands or I'd wash them with a the soap and then I'd pat him. He, he, would, he would turn his nose up to it basically. It was quite funny to see. So e elephants can't do the whole phlegm and grimace that showing the outward expression. And the reason for that is because I suppose they don't really have a top lip. Their top lip is all joined and it forms a trunk. So it's difficult for them. But zebras do it. Kudu will do it too. Inyala, Impala, Giraffe. They all show that outward expression of the phlegm and grimace. So if, if you don't know what we're talking about, if you've ever seen, like I said, a horse smile at you when it curls its top, that's the outward expression. But basically what that is, is typically they would use the Jacobson organ, which is not visible to us, but it's between their teeth and I suppose their nose, almost somewhere around there. And that is a way that they're able to tell if females are coming into estrus. It's a, like a super scent gland. Now I have spotted the rest of the herd, Craig. I think if we go down a sneaky road, which we've had many sightings on, it was a two track, but it's now become a road. I reckon if we go down there, we'll be able to get them better. Let's have a look. So they're just in over there. Now we've got a challenge in the form of this elephant who's already, oh my goodness, just drove over a stick and it cracked under my tire, that gave me a fright. So our roadblock is now in the form of this big elephant. Actually, he's coming around here and looking at this feather, fella, he's much larger. Ah, uh -uh. don't even start. Now this is gonna be fun, look at him. Hey, hey! That's not necessary. Just gonna watch him. He's very cheeky. He's not in must. He doesn't need to move around, but I also don't want to get stuck on a road where I can't move away. 
and I've got a damn wall that's not particularly open so if I needed to move out I couldn't but I don't like what I'm doing right now because I've basically let him win he's not a I'm gonna actually have to turn it on right okay <laughs> he's so cheeky I'm going to shout I'm going to shout at you again so he's a little bit older than I thought now we're not in any particular danger because I can outrun the elephant but my concern was that I wasn't going to be able to turn around in time and obviously we've got a lot of natural obstacles and we've got a dam we're on a dam wall so it's not like we can just drive anywhere we want so I'm just going to turn around again but I do want to watch him so he's much older than the other bull I'd probably put him in his early 30s he's so cheeky David, you said that you quite enjoyed that elephant's swagger. Well, I wish he'd go and take his frustrations out on that other younger bull. I don't know why he's taking them out on us. So the reason why I shouted and sort of banged on the dashboard like that is because, well, I didn't want him to think that he could just come and walk up to my car. So what would have happened if I didn't do anything is he would have tried to do an intimidation process. I don't like to get close to an elephant of that size. And he would have stood right in front of the car and he would have towered right above us. I kid you not, that to the point where I probably could have been able to, if I stretched out, I would have been able to have touched his tr uh, tusks. I don't want to do that. I don't really want to get myself into a situation like that. Shouting and banging didn't do much to him. So I know from the get-go, he's going to be trouble. He's obviously gotten away with intimidating cars before and it's now an issue, as you can see. And he needs to learn that he can't do that. But on a road like that where I don't have freedom to just drive anywhere fine, you know, if I, if I went, okay, what? Well, he's, <laughs> this is a serious charge now. Um, I'd rather not do it. I'd rather just go, okay, we'll just take a step back and we'll watch you from a distance. He's not in must. He's just a cheeky elephant bull that basically needs a hiding from a big tusker. So where's that massive tusker we had a few weeks ago that was hanging around on twin dams? We need him. Maybe he's also got his ego slightly bruised. Perhaps he's already been in and moving am amongst the breeding herd and the females have already chased him away. That probably maybe is another reason as to why he's slightly upset and now he's taking his frustrations out on us. But we'll see what we can do. We'll see if we can get another view. We might go the scenic way around to try and find the breeding herd. But we'll go back across to Tristan now and see how his cat is doing. Well, if anybody can dominate a herd of elephants, it will be Taylor McCurdy. She shall certainly use that booming voice of hers and discipline any of those young males. So don't worry, Taylor. The war is not lost. You may have lost the battle, but you haven't lost the war. And I'm sure you shall have a beautiful sighting of the elephants going forward. Our Birmingham boy is still fast asleep and taking it very easy. He's done a little roll. We've repositioned slightly and he's rolled over and is definitely very very sleepy shame he got a bit of a fright when i started the car just now and <laughs> bolted upright for two seconds and then went back down again but he's positioned himself perfectly and the reason why he rolled is because his feet i think were getting too hot and he's now lying in a situation where his feet are tucked back in the shade so you can see his whole body is covered whereas earlier the feet were sticking out in the sun and i think they were actually getting a bit on the hot side and i don't know about you guys but there's nothing worse than hot feet so i'm sure he's done a good job and you can see his tail is also tucked in into the deepest part of the shade possible so he's tucked his little tail in there as well so that's not out in the sun so he's done a very good job of finding the littlest bit of shade as possible and then making sure that he's actually in shade completely and not having too much sun on him. But isn't that cool that we can get so close and see all of the details on his back and there are those long legs which he uses for basically speed. Those are the speed legs and then the front legs are all the power. What's quite interesting is if you'll see on as the leg kind of joins the body that it's darkening quite a bit so they're just above the perceived sort of ankle is a darkening of the fur and so male lines will start to darken quite a bit and we're going to find a situation when these Birmingham boys are a little bit older maybe in the next two three years that their coats will actually become almost a black sheen to them you see it a lot in lions in the desert areas and I've seen it on the Mapojos and on the Majingalans some of them start to get a bit more of a darker sheen to them there was one lion actually in the Sabi Sands that used to have a very very dark coat and his name was the KNP male, so he was a male right down in the south of the reserve. Some of 
you might remember him as Freddy for those of you that have been watching for quite a while and he had a very very dark sheen to him he looked almost like one of the Kalahari lions he was a beautiful lion and unfortunately his coalition partner got killed by the Mopojos when I think it was one of the last sort of and I don't know if it was ever confirmed but it was one of the last run-ins that they had was with the Mopojos and his coalition member then disappeared and he was left on his own and he soon got ousted by other younger males and ended up being sort of a retiree and nomadic in the Kruger for a while and then eventually passed away and disappeared so he was probably one of the darkest male lions I've seen and, and then Harry Berry Matimba was also quite a dark boy Dennis you're wondering how strong a male lion is well, Dennis I think this is a hard thing to sort of Quanti quantify because it depends on a number of factors it depends on the condition of that animal it depends on the size of the animal remember it's much like people there's genetic differences between each lion and some will be bigger than others you'll find that some will be bulkier some will have you know a taller longer structure so it just depends on that as well as the condition of them have they been feeding are they in health are they healthy animals but I can tell you that they are very powerful if you can wrestle a 900 kilogram angry buffalo bull to the ground single-handedly you are seriously powerful and I mean I've seen what those buffalo bulls can do to cars and to varying other things the fact that lions have the power to actually topple that animal and then pin it down is astounding so they are incredibly strong and I don't think we can fathom fully just how strong they are so Justin sorry I missed a little bit of your question there Alice it just broke up if you can repeat for me Ah, how much damage could his claws cause? Well, it depends on what we're talking about. If he's going after something with a tough hide, like a buffalo, or we're we talking about something like us, because we are like a soft steak with a hot knife through butter. That's pretty much how his claws would damage us. You'd find big, massive gashes all over you. You'd be lacerated before you can even blink an eye. But in terms of the harder, tough animals like zebras and buffalo that have these thick, tough skins, you often will find evidence of where a lion has clawed at them, but it doesn't leave big gaping wounds like you would see on a human. So it just depends on the on the actual animal. I've seen impalas that have been attacked by lions and they get lacerated and big thick gashes sometimes zebras we had a zebra here on safari live at the beginning of the year that was had a massive chunk of skin taken off the side of it so it just depends i mean us as humans would never be able to withstand his claws a swipe of his claws would cause huge huge damage to us and you'd be left with big big cuts but in terms of a buffalo your skin's a bit thicker not so much it also depends on how he goes about it. You know, when they attack an animal, generally what they're trying to do is they're trying to just grab it and pull it down. So the claws are kind of being put, put in and then they're being held there. Whereas if he was going to swipe at you like they would when they fight, you would have a situation where you'd probably have a, a lot more of a sort of damage being done to you. If you had a situation where, you know, he kind of clawed at you and, and followed through with that clawing, you'd probably get a massive sort of laceration wherever it hit you. Whereas when they're catching things like buffalo, then you know they're just kind of grabbing and holding on to be able to anchor that animal and pull it down rather than actually swiping through it. And that's why you see a lot when they fight with one another, big cuts and lacerations around the face. And why male lions have big manes is because of that. So as they sort of strike out with this paw, it hits around the fur collar and the fur itself will be pulled out, but the actual neck and head of the animal will be actually okay. So that's why he's got that collar of fur and like I say, you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that clawed structure. But just as we predicted, he's going to be very sleepy for the next little bit. It's already cooled off quite a bit since we've been parked here. The sun is losing that bite that it had when we started the safari. And I would imagine within the next hour, he'll probably sleep for the next hour and then he'll start to make up, wake up. I don't think he's going to be sort of down for the whole afternoon, but he's definitely going to be quite sleepy for the next little bit. It's hot enough that he's not going to move around. So what I think we're going to do is probably But it's amazing his camouflage. If you look from here, 
look at the coloration of his coat and if you had to imagine the grass just being slightly longer you would see he would disappear in that grass look there that's the view that we have of him as we're driving luckily he was facing the other way so we had the darkness of his mane showing but it just shows you just how well they blend and when we're trying to find these guys in thick deep grass it's almost impossible they are perfectly perfectly colored to be able to blend in so there we go fast asleep Ah, Roshni, you're asking if I've ever encountered a lion on foot. Well, Roshni, many times. I've tracked quite a few lions on foot. I've had quite some entertaining experiences and some rather scary ones too. And it's, yeah, it's never for the faint-hearted. This particular male lion, where we were tracking and where I was off the car just now looking at his footprints when we started the show is probably, I would say, from here, maybe about 300 meters. It's not very far from where he was at all. He was just on the other side of a bushy thicket. And so the thing about lions is when you approach them on foot most of the time particularly here in the sabi sands because we do a lot of tracking and there's a lot of trackers out here at the commercial lodges that are on foot the lions are pretty used to people and they know that the people are not something to be too scared about because we don't chase them off their kills we don't hurt them and they generally kind of see you and they just watch you and if you come too close their immediate reaction normally is to run and to try and just sort of get some space between them and you and then from there they'll assess but if they have something like cubs or food then you'll find a situation where they can be very aggressive and you have to be very careful of what you're doing so We'll have to try and think of some of the stories and some of the sightings that I've had. I'll tell you about some of them just now. But before we do that, I think Taylor has managed to discipline that naughty elephant bull and has sorted out the herd and has hopefully now got a much better view. I showed him who's boss, that's for sure. Now, this isn't the one that gave us a bit of hassle earlier on. This is the first elephant we saw, the younger one. Even he is hanging back and steering clear. Now they, it turned out there was an even larger elephant bull too, hiding amongst the leaves. But he's come out and him and the naughty bull have walked off in the opposite direction. Now I'm just watching that they're not going to sneak back up towards us because that won't be fun. I'm not really worried about this youngster. He hasn't shown us any aggressive signs at all. And like I said, I think he's also just trying to stay out of trouble. That first elephant does just have a bad attitude. And hopefully next time he's with vehicles he won't react like that. Because that would give anybody a heart attack. Now Jordan, you're wondering if I can tell the difference between a mock charge and a real one. Most certainly, it's pretty easy. That elephant, what he was doing, he was really just trying to intimidate us. But like I said to you, he wasn't going to stop. He would have come right up to the car because he actually started running when I t t turned the car on and he was coming towards us. So I didn't want to get myself into a situation where he was standing over the car because I feel as though if you get yourself in a spot like that, very tricky to get out of, especially if he just turns and goes, you know what, I've actually had enough of you now. So I made the decision to move away and rather use my voice. I, I would have preferred to have banged on the side of my door, but I don't have a side door because the sound of metal well, is not something that is found out in nature and it intimidates the animals quite easily. And uh, You can see he's obviously been shouted at quite a few times because he really didn't respond to my voice at all. So I reckon many of the guides in the sands have probably done that. But this fella is lovely. He's really sweet. He's got a lovely nature about him. Maybe there's an underlying problem with the elephant that we don't know. Maybe he's had bad experiences with cars and he's just decided, I don't trust you lot. You need to earn my respect. Well, you know, respect comes from both sides. You can't just approach me. It was like the equivalent of somebody walking down the street and then running towards you and then also reaching into their jacket. Of course, you panic straight away and you naturally want to act defensive. But he's moved on now. I shouted at him once more and then they disappeared and they walked off in the drainage line. So thank goodness for that. We'll I didn't want to have any trouble with him. Remember, Elephants are the animal that you need to be very, very careful of. They're the only ones out you can tip the car over. And situation very, very easy. So you need to have respect and just have your earth that you don't get yourself stuck in a situation. So rather always err on the side of caution. Now, there might have been some guides that wouldn't have agreed with what I did. They could have maybe, well, maybe sat there. But like I said, I didn't want to be less than a, closer than a, a, a meter to him because then I was stuck.
you saw I had to actually turn around. I would have been quite difficult to have reversed over the dam wall. I wouldn't have felt very comfortable in doing that. But this fella is having a great time. He's gone, finally, I'm left to the entire dam all by myself. <laughs> Sonia, you say that this elephant looks like he's pretending to be busy. I think he's having just as much fun now. What I'm going to do is, Craig, let's reposition slightly. I'm going to go down and we'll look at him on the other side. Now there's a road that runs all the way down. We've actually had a couple of sightings. Tungana was here the other day, well the other day, maybe a week ago, because this Ellie had a swim. It was quite nice to watch him. We can also see how deep the water is now too. Hello boy! Isn't that so beautiful? Now I hope he doesn't go around the corner. Hopefully he stays out here. So there we go, he's not quite in the center of the dam. That is probably about, I'd say a meter and a half deep or so. So what's that? Four, f between, f yeah, about four and five foot, somewhere around there. They're not very deep. He'd have to roll around if he wanted to completely cover his body. I think he's done now though. He just thought he'd quickly wade through the water. Great way to keep yourself nice and cool. Now that's the side that he came from. He's actually, he's going out the same way he came down when we saw him in the beginning. And look how easily he walks up that steep embankment too. Elephants don't need 4x4. Four four. They've got natural 4x4 four four tread underneath their feet. It allows them to go up many different substrates. And so much power in their shoulders and in their hindquarter. It's as if they've engaged diff lock and can quite comfortably move up a steep hill like that. He's having a great day, isn't he? He must be feeling quite happy. But now you can see the water level. See how it's just underneath his tail? That just shows you how deep that water is. Yeah, I'd say about a meter and a half. Maybe actually a little bit more. Maybe closer to two meters. Just thinking if I were to stand next to him. He's not, he's not big though. He's not big like that other bull that we saw. He's slightly smaller. Somewhere around there. But I give or take. And off he goes behind the bushes. That was quite nice. At least we got our elephant fix. Hopefully it's not the, the last elephant fix for the day. Now we need to head out. Maybe we stumbled across into those naughty bulls again out in the open and we'll see if we can maybe view him from a distance. But I'm going to send you back across to Tristan. He has left the beautiful Nena. I don't know where he's going to go next. Well, Taylor, it's a secret. It's a mystery as to where we're going. But however, however we're getting there, it's a bouncy road ahead. We're bouncing around. Seb's bouncing around on the back. And it's our mysterious secret road for a secret sighting. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know actually where we're going to go. We're going to go and check Treehouse Dam. And we're going to maybe try and see if little Hosanna is somewhere around there. Given that there was young male leopard tracks on Weaver's Nest this morning. So that's where I'm heading. And well, I thought it might as well come past the new road. Because the new road seems to be Shadow and Cub's favourite haunt these days. And that's why I wanted to check here. So far, no sign of anything though, and I'm just bumbling around and enjoying the beauty that is this road. This road is one of, uh, it's fast becoming one of my favorites. I don't know why, it just seems as it's quite open. I like the link, the grass that's here, it's this nice yellow color, lots of big marulas, and I would imagine in summer it's going to be beautiful driving between all of these nice big trees. There's some torchwoods, there's knob thorns, there's marulas, and it's just a nice place to actually walk, and uh, well, not walk, drive, but walking too, actually, funny enough be nice to just come and stand here and walk well not stand here that is it completely makes no sense you can't stand and walk at the same time well you could I suppose if you did a handstand and then moved your legs would that count as standing and walking Seb yeah, good yes luck good luck with that okay well we'll have to try and see if we can do it one day today is not the day because I think I'll probably fall on my face I'll have to practice I think first before I try Good uh, position for striking at the same time. Ah, so Roshni, you're wondering about my lion encounters and any scary ones I've had. Well, I've had a few scary ones. They're probably 
the scariest one was the first time I ever walked into Lions and this is probably just because it was the first time and I was petrified as it is as this little training ranger new to the bush out of Johannesburg in the big smoke and really not knowing what the hell I was doing out here I was just kind of doing well learning really and it was not very fun at all the first few times you're petrified when you walk out here so we were walking along and we were tracking the infamous Ottawa pride down in the western parts of the Sabi Sands, well, the western parts of Sangita, should I say. And at that stage, they had two females that were rather grumpy. And Scott Dyson will be able to attest to this because next time he's live, we'll ask him about the Ottawa females, and he'll definitely have a story or two, I'm sure, about their lovely temperament that they had. They were such calm, placid girls. Not actually, at all. So anyway, where if we go, a bunch of trainee students walking along very brave and cocky as we would be because we know everything already in the first month of being on a sort of training ranger and we're walking along and we're doing our thing and we find tracks for the Ottawa Pride and now we're very excited because now we're going to track lions for the first time and so we begin to track the lions and we walk and we walk and we get to a big deep drainage line and we approach the drainage line and we walk inside the drainage line and we find all these tracks for these lions approaching a bend in the riverbed and luckily there was some sense in amongst the group and our trainer was with us and he decided no 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 you lot you're going to get yourself killed do not walk in the riverbed you need to go out of the riverbed because there's a big corner and what if the lines are on the other side and you bump into them so we duly go up the bank walking all cocky walking along walking along and no one's really paying attention now because we're up on the bank and it's no nowhere near as sort of tight atmosphere and nowhere near as scary being out in the open section and as we're walking along the edge we approach the sort of other side of the bend and we get there and we are met by fury there is just a sound explosion there's these lions come bolting out of the riverbed straight towards us there's two lionesses teeth bared tails going and are very upset and they run straight towards us and they start snarling and hissing and luckily I was not carrying the rifle I was second in the line of people and we had to stand there and you kind of never know what your reaction is going to be because they always tell you don't run but let me tell you when there's two 150 kilogram or 300 pound cats bearing down on you with teeth exposed and tails whipping about and growling and sound like as though hell is coming towards you you then kind of stop and you notice what's going on and either you run or you stand your ground and luckily all of us stood our ground and the lionesses then went running back to where they came from and then back again and every time they ran back to where they had come from we would try to take a few steps back and eventually we got to the point where we were far enough away that the lionesses stopped and the reason why they charged us is because the Ottawa Pride had recently given birth to new cubs and it was the first First time these little cubs had been taken to a carcass and it just so happened to be a carcass of the same animal that is standing directly in front of me a wildebeest and so they were very upset about the fact that we had just walked into this pri well this dinner scene with cubs and those females took very big exception to that and they then came charging out at us and made sure we knew exactly who was boss of what was going on and that that food was not for them so that was my introduction to tracking lions it was a quite a sort of serious one and luckily no harm was done to either lions or ourselves and we were able to get out unscathed since then quite a few of those kind of moments where lionesses have charged to that point where they are no more than about a meter or two meters away from you i find the lionesses are a lot more grumpy than the males they tend to be the males tend to give you a bit of a warning but they're not too bad So, Paul, you're asking if I didn't have a scary experience with Hosanna. Paul, I wouldn't have described it as scary, more as fascinating. I if he had been maybe three years older, I would have been absolutely petrified of what had happened. But at the time, given that he was a young male, this was a few months ago, but I was tracking him near Twin Dams and... Oh, sorry, my mic pack has just fallen out of the car. But I was tracking him a few months ago and we tracked him and I was walking along and I came round a bush and there was Hosanna lying right next to me, I, no more than the end of the car from where I was walking. And he kind of trotted off a little bit, maybe about three meters, and then turned and just stared at me. And I thought, well, okay, now it's time to walk off. And with leopards generally the rule is and all the trackers that have told me is that you don't stare a leopard in the eye you just kind of if you see it like that then you just pretend like you haven't seen it and carry on walking so this is what I decided to do but little Hosanna thought maybe there was a game to be played because every 
time I would try and walk, he would come following behind me and not walking, he would trot behind me. And if I turned and then stopped, he would stop and just watch me. So it was a bit unnerving in the fact that he was following and kind of keeping up with me. But it was in no way an aggressive situation. He didn't once snarl, he didn't do anything. But had it been three years later and a big male leopard, I would have been a lot more scared of what was going on because that's not behavior that you want to see from a big male leopard because he'd easily be able to sort you out. So it wasn't too bad. And while it was a sort of interesting experience, I wasn't in any way scared throughout that one. The other interesting one I had was of the Inkahuma females, and they are generally a very placid bunch. I've walked into the Inkahuma females countless times, and they're normally not too bad. But last year was also quite a funny one. My tracker and I, we had seen quite a lot with the group, uh, the guests that I'd had at the time, and we were really kind of enjoying our afternoon of just bumbling around. And we hadn't seen, we'd seen lions, but not very well. And all of a sudden we were driving and there was lots of vultures, and I had seen the vultures before, the day before and no one had really followed up in that area and I was on my way somewhere else that I didn't actually go and check which is a lesson that you should always go and check things and make sure so we decided this afternoon we would go and have a little look and see what was going on so we went trundling off into the bush and walked and walked and we must have walked maybe about I would say 300 meters off the road I would walk 300 meters and we found there lay a dead kudu but this kudu had been dead for a while it was stinky it had been eaten quite a bit and we thought the vultures had got stuck in and so my tracker and I walked up to the carcass we didn't see any signs of any tracks then we got to the carcass itself and both of us kind of looked at each other with that look of what have we done as we both noticed very clear tracks for lionesses right next to this kudu carcass and we thought whoopsie this is not good anyway we couldn't see any lions and so we had a look at this kudu bull because he was magnificent he had these huge horns and I was saying to my tracker look at how beautiful these horns are and he was saying yeah these are really nice and this is a big kudu and you know it must have been the Nkuhuma females and you know we were just discussing things and anyway this sort of noise started off to our sort of in front of us it wasn't too far away and both of us, because it was quite close to the gate, we kind of turned to each other and I was like, is that a quad bike or a motorbike? And he was like, I don't know. And we sort of discussed it for a while until we heard the rustling of a bush. And there in front of us was Amber Eyes staring at us with disdain as to what are you doing on my carcass and why are you touching it? And then kind of gave a little growl and came running at us. And that was enough to prompt both of us to go scattering back to the vehicle as quick as possible. And it turned out to be Amber Eyes and the youngest female were on this kudu kill to the, together and it was quite a, quite a scare we got. So that's, there's some of my more sort of hairy moments with lions. I've had quite a few where they've moved off. UK Amanda, you say we have such an exciting job. Well, I agree, UK Amanda, we have the best job in the whole world. Undoubtedly, you can ask Taylor, James, Brent, Jamie, Ali, Scott, Byron, they'll all tell you that this is single-handedly the best thing to do in the world. We love what we do. Being out in here, seeing nature, driving around, walking around, having these moments with wildlife is just something that you can't really express and something that you can't fully be able to sort of understand until you experience it and that's why what we do in terms of this is so amazing because we're able to bring all of you from anywhere in the world into this and into our lives and to show you just how this all works and how it goes so it's really quite special to have all of you here with us and to be part of the biggest safari vehicle in the world So, George, you say I tell a good story. Well, I don't know, George. I'm not the best storyteller. They are far better. James Hendry tells a very good story, I must be honest, and Scott Dyson, too. They both are excellent storytellers. And I, I know that Brent also can spin a good yarn when he wants to as well and spin a good story. So... I kind of learned from them, I think, but I'm not the best storyteller by far. The camp is riddled with other characters that tell much better stories than what I do. I just kind of tell what, I ha what happened to me and they make me happy and make me excited and make me sort of remember all of these fond things and so maybe that's why they come off well. But thank you very much for your comment, I appreciate that. Right, now...
on to the top of that branch. Are you going to do a good job? Doing a pretty amazing job. Craig, do you think you could balance up there on the tip of that branch like that bird? Craig says possibly, perhaps it's because he's Batman and he's had some special training. But there's a whole lot of them around you. There's actually one that's just, oh no, where are you going to land now? There's a couple of them. They're quite sociable birds. There's about three or so of those white crowned shrikes and then there was a drongo hanging about too, but they keep flying off. Lovely birds. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go check the hyena den, so we're not too far away. Obviously we tried this morning, we didn't have any luck. When we were looking with for animals that started with an H, we had to go back to the old hornbill. So we will try again for hyenas this afternoon. But I'm just trying to think, I haven't had too many hair raising encounters. I've had two serious charges with elephant bulls and that's really about it. I've been charged by a black rhino once on the middle of an open area as well. Can you believe that? Mm. I think that's really it. On foot, so? Where? Oh yes! And Craig just kindly reminded me that I was once almost killed by a buffalo too. <laughs> that happened. That happened right outside camp too. That was an exciting experience. Don't ever want that to happen to me ever again. Um, and then on foot I've been charged by lions. It's not too bad. But like, like Tristan was saying, it's very difficult to tell yourself not to run and even when an elephant bull sort of mock charges you or shakes his head that's intimidating but you really can't go anywhere then obviously you've you've got to stand your ground but it's intimidating very very intimidating especially when you're looking up at an elephant not fun so we try and avoid situations like that but luckily for us oh yes <laughs> Alice has just uh, fed through to me now uh, Tristan, I think Tristan's a little bit confused though about my, the buffalo charge. He said a chele pan, so it wasn't a chele pan. It was with David. David, I'm always with with uh, David when I have animal charges since I've been here at Wild Earth. So the ones, remember we found that uh, buffalo cow that had a broken leg and then I was radioing a final control to let them know, uh, to tell the bushwalk team not to come anywhere in this area and then she started charging us in turn right at the last second too. So I suppose in a vehicle I've been charged twice by elephants, by a black rhino and then also by a buffalo which was unusual to be charged by a buffalo in a car but when an animal's got a broken leg you can imagine how distressed they were and we weren't even planning on viewing her either we were just purely giving the update as to where she was and we we're going to leave her alone and I wasn't concentrating well I was obviously looking down to find the radio and that's when she made her move so you've got to have your wits about you even in a car and I, that day made me nervous because she was coming straight towards me and there was there's no door here so I was getting ready I was climbing like this to go <laughs> other side because the car wouldn't start and I thought well there goes our opportunity to try and move so I was just like oh well she's not going to turn the car over I'll just sit on that side on the other seat and then she won't be able to get me but luckily those side, those things have happened in gee all those sort of things have happened only in the last few years not right at the beginning except one of the elephant encounters come on hyenas oh where are you I don't see them just yet Oh, yeah, I see you. Hello, friends. I see two little hyenas. Now, it doesn't look like the adults are here, so we'll only stay for a little bit, and then we're going to have to move out. Let me just pull off to the side. Let me go a little bit further forward, Craig, so you can see the, the youngest one, the youngest hyena cub, just sitting to the left of Antima. Oh, they're looking so tired. They must be enjoying the last of the afternoon sun. Oh, okay. Normally it's the other way around. Normally it's the youngest cub that climbs on the oldest one. For looking for comfort. And it seems as though the older one's just going to flop over the top of it. But isn't that so sweet? Very peaceful scene. Now I wonder where the adults are because the last couple of times I've popped in I haven't seen them around. Perhaps they're busy elsewhere swatting flies. There's lots of flies out today, I suppose because it's nice and hot. And they don't seem to be interested in us at all this afternoon. Well, not yet. Maybe at some point. Go away, fly. Get out of here. You've got the entire whole of Africa to fly around. You don't need to fly right next to me. Flies. 
one of the most annoying things, Archie. I'm going to have to get a guari bush today, I reckon. But this is very, very nice, of course, and I'm sure that you're all very happy to see these hyenas. You had a nice sighting with Tristan this morning, I think. Did Tristan have a sighting with hyena? Ooh, when, was that yesterday? No, that was yesterday, sorry, where the hyena's wanting to bite his tires. Now, Barbara, you've said that you love hyenas. Oh, look at that face. Isn't that so precious? They are so sweet when they're this age, so fluffy. But look at those very droopy eyes. It's almost impossible to keep them open. Now, Tony, you say flat spots, I suppose. Not leopard spots this time, but hyena spots laying as flat as they can be down on the ground. They've obviously had quite a busy day. And it looks like they've brought a couple of things up to the den to chew. Craig, can we have a closer look at that thing on the right? That white thing. Is it a bone? Does it look like a bone? Does it look like... I actually don't know what that is. Part of it, or is it a log? It's difficult to tell what that actually is. Maybe part of a buffalo skull? The horns, maybe? And then that part is the actual skull? I don't actually know. There's lots... Of, just the reason why I'm thinking that is before the, from that coloration. And then I also know how many buffalo the Nkuhumas took down in this area so it's definitely a possibility but I'm glad that they're resting and not paying too much attention to us today they are very inquisitive normally as you've seen over the last couple of times and they can be quite destructive and what destructive <laughs> I think I just made up a word there <laughs> destructive <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Sorry, I meant to say destructive. Um, oh my goodness. Now, Alice, sorry, can I have that question again? I was obviously laughing at myself and I couldn't hear your voice over the sound of my noisy voice. Now, it's a question from Rachel and it's why are the hyena cubs outside of the den? if the adults are not around. Well, they do have freedom to sort of move around within the den. They're obviously told by the adults, you stay put, you're not allowed to leave the house. They're basically under house arrest, if you think about it. They can't go anywhere. Um, but at least they've got a nice home to live in. Um, so they will come out, they'll play, they'll chew on things, they'll walk around a little bit. It's not uncommon for them to go and wonder. We see them, they come right up to the cars sometimes and smell the tires and all those types of things. Sometimes chew on the tires too, which we don't want them to do. Um, but it's not a problem that they're outside the den. And that's why we don't want to stay here for too long. So I'm actually going to move out now because the adults are not around here. And it's not fair on them to not have parental guidance in case something goes wrong. Right, let's reverse. Now, hello, Carsten from Denmark. Let me try and turn here. Bye. We'll see you. See you soon. Uh, you're wondering at what age are hyenas considered... Sorry, Craigie. Luckily, it's just a guari tree. What age are hyenas considered adults? I'll get, uh, I'll get there eventually. Sometimes it takes me a bit of time, especially when I'm reversing, to get to these questions. Um, trying to think now. I would say... I would reckon around two and a half, three years old. You could probably consider a hyena to be a... It's so bumpy in here. Now there were also some Franklins alarming just a moment ago. I don't know what had got their feathers ruffled. Perhaps we'll go and check Galago Pan now and see if there's anything around there having a drink. Then maybe we'll go past Buyatella Dam after that. And then who knows what else we might find this afternoon. A leopard would be good. Maybe see Tristan will follow up on that male lion a little bit later. As we saw yesterday, we try to be, well, we were quite patient with Tignol. And they'll just sleep for hours and hours. And especially if he's done a bit of moving during the day, we might find that he, he does need to catch up on some much needed sleep. I don't actually know what condition he is, if he had a full belly or not. Taylor, you're going to have to guess where I'm driving. Maybe 
Alice can describe what she sees and maybe you'll be able to guess where I am. Let's play that game and see if Taylor knows where I am. I know where she is because I just got told she was at the Hyena Den, but whether she's going to go north or south from the Hyena Den is anyone's question. But she came from Buffelzook Dam, so I'd imagine her next bet is going to be coming southwards. That's what I'm going to call. Am I right, Alice? Did she turn left or right out of the den? Oh, Alice is not answering me just yet. Hmm, decisions, decisions, Alice. You're gonna have to get this right. She turned left. Woohoo! We were right. She turned south. Well done. Now I wonder if she can guess where I am. They can't do either. It's got to be one or the other. It's not like I said she either's going to turn right or left. That doesn't help. But I am at Twin Dams. That's exactly where I am. So there is a beautiful monitor lizard that we saw this morning that is still sitting perfectly on the edge of the water. There he is, just kind of taking it very easy. Got a little pillow in the form of some molded clay on the edge of the water where eelies and other things have walked around and caused a bit of the clay to kind of develop. And so, perfect place to rest your head. Hello, monitor lizard. Oh, are you sleepy? Look at the size of those claws. Aren't they amazing? You would think for a lizard they wouldn't have such big claws. They almost rival that of some of the cat species. You'd imagine actually a leopard claw would be probably of a similar length to what you see on that. Maybe a little bit bulkier than what the monitor lizards got, but similar length. And they need that to be able to grip on sand and when they climb trees. We know monitor lizards, both rock and water monitors, are very, very, very good at climbing any type of tree. And so those will help just to grip and climb, much like we see with the leopard's claw and even lions when they climb from time to time. So very useful and you can see then a perfect coloration that blends in with vegetation that's normally around water because remember most vegetation around water is generally going to be quite green and, and bright given that it has high concentrations of water. You can actually see the grass there is a little bit green and so that coloration that it's got will blend perfectly. It's got these sort of muted yellows and greens and broken patterns and that will help it just to blend into its environment particularly when doing what it's doing now which is sunning itself, getting that body temperature up and then able to hunt from there. Jenny Animation, you say our monitor lizard is being monitored. Well, yes, it is. Look, it even notices it's been monitored. Hello, monitor lizard. What have you seen? Isn't that a beady eye? Hunter, the monitor lizards are quite interesting in terms of what they eat. They have got quite a wide array of food items that they go for. Primarily what they'll go for though is eggs. So varying types of birds that nest on the shores of water. So the lapwings um, that we see here, plovers, even ducks to a degree, they'll go after their eggs. They'll also get the odd insects. They sometimes even scavenge off carrion. You'll see them getting into, stuck into some carrion from time to time. Small fish if they can get hold of them. Frogs are a big part of their diet. So quite a varied array for the water monitor. The rock monitor is more eggs and small mammals and insects. That's what that will feed off. And even sometimes snakes. I've seen them go after snakes from time to time too. And other lizards. And particularly smaller lizards like the striped skinks, rainbow skinks, those kind of things. They do go after them sometimes too. But look at that. That's such a nice view of one. And that beautiful afternoon light just bringing out those colors. Ah, Jonathan, who's 11 years old from Alabama in the United States. Hello, Jonathan. I hope you're having a wonderful day. You're wondering if we have any of the lizards that can run on water. Unfortunately not, Jonathan. I really wish we did. I think they're called Jesus lizards, if I'm correct. But they all... Yeah, I think it is Jesus Lizard. I'm not I'm not 100% sure, but they we don't get them here unfortunately. I, I really wish we did because it looks phenomenal to watch these lizards run across water. They have those big webbed feet and they spread their toes out and that causes a massive amount of surface area that can keep them buoyant enough to then paddle across and run across water. So unfortunately our monitor lizards can't do that but what you will find is you see how long the tail is on this lizard Jonathan. It's got a very long tail and that means that this lizard can swim very well. That's like having when you go into the water and if you put on fins or 
flippers you might know them as and you go into water and you kick with them you can feel that you can swim faster and so imagine having very long tail like that much like a crocodile it helps to push this lizard through the water and it's able to move quite fast through the surface of the water but not on top So, Kim, this monitor lizard is not as big as it's going to get. This is still a small monitor lizard. In fact, I would say this is about half the size of some of the ones we do get out here. Their tails are very long, so this one looks much longer just because its tail is sticking out. But it is still fairly small in comparison to some of the other ones I've seen here. There are some monster monitor lizards, particularly the one that moves from Twin Dams to Gauri Dam. We often see its tracks along the road. That is a very big lizard indeed, and probably, I would say, maybe not double but one and a half times the size of this guy so they still will get bigger and the rock monitors while they don't necessarily get as long their tail tends to be a little bit shorter but they do get much heavier set than the water monitors big thick necks and heads and bulky legs that they move around on land and you'll often find them in the trees walking around yes we are talking about you there's something sort of cunning about lizards don't you think they the way that they look at us it almost looks as though they're up to something and plotting and scheming almost conniving type creatures i don't know why i always get that it's, maybe it's because the way they sort of squint their eyes slightly and close their eyelid a little bit that they look like that so david you're asking if they're territorial david i'm honestly not sure um I do know that they do compete quite heavily over females, which generally is typical of a territorial animal, but I'm not 100% sure. I might be wrong in saying that, but I know that they do fight quite a lot with one another. Males will often go up on back legs and grab each other, bite each other by the neck, whip with their tails. It's quite something actually watching monitor lizards fight. It gets very rough and you'll see them twisting and turning and rolling around and even rolling off banks like this into water. It's quite something. So I think they are territorial, but I'm not 100% sure. I might be wrong. And I'll actually let me see if I can't find out for you while I'm sitting here. Oh, Hunter, you're wondering how we tell the difference between a male and a female. I'm actually not 100% sure either, Hunter. I don't think there is a way to tell other than by size-wise. Um, a lot of the time with the lizards, you'll find that sometimes the males, I mean the females are a little bit larger. In this case, I'm not 100% sure. I'm going to try to find out for you, Hunter, and see if I can't find some sort of information as to whether the male or female is bigger. Mm, it doesn't say anything about it being bigger or smaller. It just it doesn't say actually if the male is bigger or the female is bigger. So maybe there isn't any way to tell the difference. I'll have to look it up and see for you, Hunter. But I'm not sure. Now, in terms of territorial, yes, they are territorial. So there we go. They are territorial animals, and they do definitely fight with one another's but in terms of male and female we'll have to try and research that a bit more for you hunter there we go it's decided it's time to move now so you can get an appreciation for just how long that tail is you see the tail is almost the same length as the body very very big so francis from israel sorry about the wind it might be really blowing into the mic so i do apologize if it's a bit windy i'm going to try to face my head away um francis they mostly are seen on their own and unless they're mating or they're in a territorial dispute for a mate the most i've seen together is five which seems to be a whole bunch of males coming towards a female and they were then maybe wrestling with one another there was lots of sort of fighting and chasing of each other but generally yes on their own like this it's very seldom you'll see monitor lizards together um, unless they Where are you off to though? You're running out of space. Jenny, animation, you asking if they are closely related to Komodo dragons. Well, they're pretty much in the same family. So, yes, there is some relation there it's probably quite a distant one but these are one of the bigger lizards that you get in the world um, and very similar to what the Komodo dragons are so same kind of situation in fact funny enough talking about whether there's two of them there is another one right there in front of this one 
Now I'm going to try to go forward a little bit, Seb. See if you can see it. Can you see its tail just in front of its head? Oh, Got to be careful I don't go... Oh, let's see if we're going to have a territorial... Are oh, we going to have some mating? No, they've just climbed over one another. It's difficult to see because they're behind a clump of grass. But you can see there's the head of one. Now that's one slightly larger. And then the other one's gone over the top towards the other side of the clump of grass. Of course there would be a clump of grass exactly where we're trying to look. But there's definitely two of them there. There's not just the one. Come on, 